All right, so this is, uh, I am Alo Hernandez, and this is a session topic on running NoSQL on SQL. So running NoSQL loads with all their advantages on top of relational traditional, if you want to call it, databases. Um, we've seen the uh, basically most important NoSQL selling points uh, captured from all the input from all the participants in this topic, this session, which are the NoSQL databases. So for you, schema less with elastic schema uh, and uh, allowing to you to uh, store semi or non-structured data in the database, which are well suited for big data, uh, which uh, may be or may not be cheap if you take into account the whole TCO concept um, for DBAs, that they scale well, they have an API more one-to-one uh, -one mapping to the object ring world, and that they are supposed to be fast. We're now analyzing the, uh, which of the ACID characteristics from relational databases are um, offered by, in general terms, by NoSQL solutions. And the atomicity is basically not really offered. I mean, there are no transactions. Because the documents or the key values are atomic on its own, which means that your data is not going to get corrupted in the first place because your documents are not going to be partially written to disk. That, well, yeah, no, okay. There's some atomicity there, but very, very relative. Consistency. Uh, they used to talk about consistency in, in, in a different way, which is the, the way uh, the, the, um, designed in the, in the CAP theorem or the Brewer's theorem about, uh, uh, you know, what the CAP theorem is. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is a different thing. CAP theorem states that out of these three characteristics, which are consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, you can only pick two. You can never pick three. Any two, but not three of them. So this kind of consistency, it's basically, when NoSQL talks about consistency, it mixes, mixes a little bit this and talk about this consistency, which means that uh, at, a, at a given time, uh, you may get consistent data, which means that if you're uh, working in a distributed environment and you query data out of a slave, the data that you may get from that slave is a little bit stale because uh, new insertions or updates or whatever have not been replicated yet, but you will eventually get the data. That's what is called eventual consistency. So there are different consistency models. Strong consistency means that you always get the most recent data. Uh, and then you can talk about ordering, about the data, so that's a lot, whole topic about consistency. Then we've got, so this consistency, we're going to put a question mark. Just well, it varies a lot. But basically, few of them, if any, offer a strong consistency. Because if you want to scale and you want to remain available, and you want to be able to support partitions, network partitions, which happen, which happen a lot, you have to choose A and P out of the CAP theorem. And so you basically need to uh, resign from being consistent. So you choose eventual consistency, which is, um, well, OK has some problems too. Isolation, they usually don't offer any isolation. So, uh, for example, in Mongo, if you're doing a query, a uh, large query, which returns a lot of documents, and Mongo uh, does not ret returns all the results at once, so you get like a cursor, and you then ask for the next results. It may happen to you that while asking for next results, you may see new documents that were not part of the original query. Like, for example, if you uh, do a query and then concurrently you delete one document that you have already read and store it again into the database, you may get it again. So you'll see the same document twice. That, that's possible to happen. So they don't have much isolation. Let's see. That's what's called read and committed isolation level, which is quite cool. And finally, durability. They offer, in general terms, durability. However, they don't get it right, mostly. They claim to be durable, which means that you're not going to lose data. And that's usually not actually true. And this is the part that few people get, get to understand, because their marketing strategies 
uh, are finding hard disks this thing. But if you look internally into the details, yes, there is a window, an unbounded window of data loss in most of the, the, their cases. So take care when using it. Now, let's, let's move on. So uh, I'm going to give my personal opinion on these topics. First one is a schema-less, or elastic schema, or semi, or non-structured data. It's basically the same thing. Basically, it means that uh, you can, you can uh, uh, basically store data without, uh, uh, without having any, any uh, uh, a design in advance about the structure of the data. That's basically what it means. And especially the schema-less, which is the word they use for defining NoSQL word, is, in my opinion, absolutely false. Because some of you already uh, mentioned it here. There is a schema in the data. Otherwise, you, you won't be able to consume it, right? So there is a schema. It just happened to be quite elastic, right? It can vary from document to document, or for, um, from key to key, from value to value, to be more precise. But even the name key value, the key is a schema, right? So it's not a schema less, there is a schema. This happens to change. So schema is, is a fallacy. So I call it attached schema. Which means that the, uh, the schema is attached to the data. And if, if you think about it, and that's one of the points of what we're doing right now, if the schema happened for whatever reason to be frequently repeated, because, well, after all, you need to consume the data, right? So if the data uh, is of a certain type, because you want to consume it later on, then you uh, are repeating all the time the schema. So you're wasting I.O., network, uh, you're wasting uh, storage, because you're consistently on time, or most of the time, repeating most of the same schemas. And this is one of the topics I want to touch. The big data. This is only marketing. Indeed, some NoSQL databases are pretty bad for big data. Usually, big data means um, the, what it's called, the three Vs, which is uh, velocity, variety, and uh, variance of data. And um, some of them are pretty bad for big data. Like, for example, uh, they don't have a lot of techniques for big data. And they take a lot of space, and so you need a lot of servers to perform big data. It's not that you cannot do it, you can do it. But it's just that some of them, they're not very good for it. Some of all those are, are really good for it. OK, talking about cheapness, I think this is absolutely true. They are not that cheap. They look cheap, but they are a new paradigm. They are, uh, you need people train in a different way. You need new support contracts. You require new servers, probably, uh, new infrastructure, new procedures. You can fire all your DBAs. No? Huh? You can fire all your DBAs. Yeah, you can fire all the DBAs that you had before, but uh, most companies don't want to do that for whatever reason. Especially if they want to keep all, all the systems, right? <laughs> so you basically need new people here and new procedures, the service, people certify the different things. People is not even able to certify from most databases yet because no certifications exist. So uh, it's just, uh, yeah, it's not really so cheap in terms of total cost of ownership from this perspective. And this is another topic we're touching. Scalability, this is uh, not a lie. They can scale, but it's a myth in the sense that they claim to be infinitely scalable. So the, the selling point is that you can become Google if you use this NoSQL database. <laughs> so most uh, CTOs buy it right away and say, yes, I want to become Google. Things that they will never become Google. So they're purchasing a solution which uh, can scale a lot, but maybe they don't need to scale that much. For instance, MongoDB, one of the supposedly more sc scalable databases, in their own corporate blog, tell you not to scale unless it's really the last choice to horizontally scale, basically. They try, you, try to force you to scale vertically as much as possible before going horizontally because it's a pain. It has its own problems and it's less performing. 
So you can scale, but uh, not as, as, as much as, as they say, and probably uh, this has, should be not the driving decision for choosing NoSQL. What do you mean by vertically scaling? Verti okay, sorry, sorry for not explaining that. Vert vertical scaling, it's basically putting a bigger machine. Right? So you can add more RAM, more disk, more processors, and you could scale better. So even Mongo, which is surprisingly bad for, for vertical scaling because uh, it's, it's not concurrent. In, in, in Mongo, you cannot perform a, a write and a read at the same time for the same database. They require an exclusive lock for any uh, write operation. So even in, the, in, the, in their case, they are suggesting to, to vertical scale. That talks something about their scalability. But I think it's something expected, right? It's must it's must faster to read data locally than transferring data over the network. So absolutely, it's something expected. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. But people get very easily. Oh yeah, let's scale. Let's put a cluster of dozens of servers rather than a big one. It mm -hmm. performs absolutely worse and leads to all the problems. The API, I, I do agree here. The API, in, I mean, most NoSQL APIs are not very good in my opinion, but people love them for whatever reason. So that's, that's, a, that's a thing to take. And finally, they are supposed to be fast. Uh, the truth is that most of them are not. Or they are, but uh, in a way where it breaks very badly ACID and so yeah, it's easy to become fast if, for example, you don't enforce your ability. I mean, if you can lose data, it can make any SQL, any SQL database really fast, but may lose data, <laughs> right? So if you don't want to lose data, you're not that fast. And sometimes they're way slower than relational databases when enforcing strict durability, which is uh, something they were built for. Okay, so with this introduction, uh, what I wanted to do here is present some open source solution in which we are developing from scratch, which is uh, a database, a NoSQL database. So we are developing a NoSQL database. However, uh, most NoSQL databases, what they have done so far, is create a new paradigm of storing data, like the document range model, which is quite appealing for a lot of people. But then they have written their own different, from scratch, uh, storage engines and I can tell you that uh, writing a storage engine is really hard. In the university I was taught that it's the hardest uh, computer software problem ever, even more complex than compilers. May or may not agree with that, but it's really complex. It's very difficult to get transactions and consistency and isolation and especially durability. It's really hard to get it right that your data will survive a crash. So they are reinventing the wheel, in my opinion. So what we did is, it's OK to have a new model, like the document-oriented model, but don't reinvent the wheel. Take something which already works, which is a good storage engine, and use it. So we're building a, a new NoSQL database, which uses a SQL database as a storage engine. What do we get with that? Well, we still offer schema less and elastic schema and semi or non-structured data because that's the model that it uh, that it's implementing. It uh, it is really good, by the way, for big data. We have like two versions, a vanilla and a big data version, and that one is really good for big data. The most compelling argument is this one: it becomes cheap because you already have the infrastructure. You already have the deviated, you don't need to fire, right? And they are certified, you have the support contracts, so you have everything most companies do. So uh, it's very easy, very cheap to change. And it has the same scalability rules as NoSQL databases, has the same API, well, one of them. And about speed, well, it, this is an early stage development. So right now, benchmarks are not yet that good, but we have implemented some techniques, which once we optimize the code, may lead to really fast performance compared to NoSQL databases. That's what I want to be talking about a little bit. 
So, uh, I'm thinking how can you say unstructured data in an SQL database? Yes, yes, that's the real topic here. How do we do that? And how, in doing that, we are able to offer fast performance. <laughs> well, <laughs> flip it around and write it back. Yeah. Once again, we're going to try to find a spot. Mm -hmm. Open this up and we'll put it. gonna get into the details but if if anyone wants to we can we can look at them and we can look at source code it's gonna be open source when we published in, in github it's not yet there because the project is not finished and we want to publish it when it's let's say basically functional otherwise it could be it's to be attacked by some of our probable competitors but other than that the big question is how do we do that and that takes us to the first fallacy which is the schema less so I was saying there is a schema. We call that schema the document type. So this is a doc so um, before just going to, into this, what we're doing is first of all we uh, talk the Mongo wired protocol, so the network protocol. So uh, we speak their language. So you can replace Mongo by our solution, right? So it's a native. So it's like using the Mongo. Java drivers for yes. Your yes. Version. Yeah. Nice. So to connect to our database, you would use this Mongo drivers. You can use the Mongo console. Whatever. It just we talk the protocol. So uh, clients should not no notice the difference. Uh, we can use any relational database. Uh, so far, uh, we are doing this for Postgres. SQL, which in my opinion is probably the best uh, relational database out there. But uh, all the databases like Oracle or and SQL Server are, of course, in our roadmap. And uh, it does something which is what we call transparent all right, transparent data type partitioning. So it partitions the data. Partitions in, in database terminology basically means that uh, you take your whole set of data and you partition it into smaller subsets by some criteria. And then when you need to query uh, data which is constrained within one of those partitions, you need to scan the whole database, right? So you scan only that partition. Of course, that, that introduces a lot of efficiency. Typical partitioning schemes are by date, like for example. So you partition by month. And then you do you, when you do a query within a constraint within a month, you need to scale the whole the whole table, the whole data, database. You just uh, are constrained to that that small partition. We do that, and we do it transparently, uh, and we partition by type. So to get this written here, so we have MongoDB wire protocol implementation. By all with Mongo, you can use. Postgres or any other relational, not MySQL, and uh, partition by data, data type. Um, what is this? Which is, by the way, transparent, transparent to the user. You, you don't need to do anything. So. Going back to the schema-less policy, all NoSQL documents have a structure, have schema, and that schema is attached to the data. It comes with the document. Specifically, when you look at Mongo, Mongo uh, works, it's not, it's not talking JSON, as most people think, that's a client interface. But the client-server interface talks BISON, which is a serialized binary version of JSON, which has data types. 
explicit data type. So each data has with, comes with a name and a data type. It's just strongly typed. So uh, a data type is, is for, for us, a document data type is a document which has the same uh, uh, keys and, 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 and values, even they are, they are nested, they are in structures, they are containers, and the same data types. So basically two documents that are the same, of the same net, uh, depth levels and the same elements, not the same values, just the same structure. So documents that say are a common structure, they are stored in, a, in, a, in one region of the database, whereas other structures are stored on a different region of the database. That's part of the answer to your question. But this leads to high efficiency, efficiency because if you are doing a query, for example, on a field, let's say that there's a database about this conference, and we have people in the database, and people have age. Certainly not everybody wants to say what their age is, so this field may be filled in or not filled in. Now, if you want to do a query about how many people is over 18 years old, uh, in a regular database, NoSQL database, you would need to scan the whole database and perform as much I.O. as the service, as the disk space. Whereas here, we'll have separated which uh, document types have age and which don't. So you will scan only a subset of the database. Which leads to less I.O. and then more performance. Indeed, there are some, some queries which we're even performing from memory without even reading from the database because the different number of structures there in, in our product, they're cached in RAM. If they are, if, because this number is usually pretty low. If you take a million document collection, it usually turns out to have few data types. Otherwise, you, it will be quite difficult to consume the data. So there, there's a small number here, and this number is cached in RAM. So if you do a query, which the answer is zero because there is no such document, like for example, document that contains the key, whatever, and it's a non-existing key. We can uh, answer that query from memory without even touching the database, whereas another NoSQL database would have to scan the whole database. So that's a huge performance benefit. Now, how does this work? Where, where's the magic? So basically, what we do is not, it's not trivial, but uh, we take a document, NoSQL document, and we split it into parts, where each part is a separate level. Think of depth uh, levels, and then you'll get it right. So um, if we have, for example, an object which is like, um, let's say, name, yeah, we have here name, whatever, a, we have surname, B, and we have address, and this is a nested object where we have the street name, whatever, and the zip code, make it simple. So this document has two levels. So what we would do is, first of all, analyze the, the data type. So this is a data type which has a name, a surname, an address, an address which is a compound object. And this object contains a string and zip. That's the structure. So first of all, we will store this structure, right? Which, five minutes. Which basically looks like something like this. T1 and then uh, address. Two. Something like this. So there's this is a structure. So we stored it as this structure as a separate piece of information. It can be reused by so many, many documents. Basically says that there's one level here, and then the field address is a nested level, and that goes to a single place. And then this information, which belongs to the first level, is stored on a one table and this information is stored on a different table. That's basically it. So, um, well, there's uh, structures, there's tables for data, there's tables for the document itself to tell which structure is the document, given document using, 
and uh, where's the data from that document. And the thing is that these tables, if, if you look at, at these tables, so think right now about the table with a column called name and a column called surname, where this is a string and this is an integer or whatever, that's a really efficient way of storing this data. Because we are not repeating all the time that this is the name, we're only saying it once. We're only saying it once that this is a surname, and we're only saying it once that this is a string and an integer or whatever. So this is a quite efficient way of, of storing data. Indeed, we, uh, we're achieving really high efficiency on, on storing things, on storing data sets compared to Mongo, for example. And here I can give you some numbers um, that we've been uh, doing recently some benchmarking. And uh, I'll show it to you. Uh, sorry, I don't have a slide here. So um, it's going to be more or less of just uh, Telling you the numbers, but uh, basically, in, in general terms, we are achieving compared to so comparing to Mongo, for example, uh, the uh, if you take the raw data and store some some raw data in into Mongo, it usually multiplies the space required, the disk space required for that information by a factor of one point something to two. You have a, a two gigabyte collection, it will require four gigabytes of disk space uh, in, in, in disk, disk space. What we're achieving is a fraction of the original text in, in the storage. So way less than, than Mongo. And this is because, first of all, we are not repeating, repeating the structure all the time, and we are storing data way more efficiently. It's a better packed with data. For some reason, this is not coming alive now. Okay, demo effect. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. The other thing that we're doing, I mentioned that there's like a big data version, right? It's just optimal for big data. You know what ver uh, column stores are or vertical databases are? Well, vertical databases or vertical column stores or column stores sorry, are databases where data is written in columns rather than in rows. Uh, the advantage of doing that is that uh, you are exploiting locality of the same data types. Okay. I wasn't thinking about this. Okay. So I'm sorry you didn't uh, prepare a presentation. So I just draw data here in a, on a on a spreadsheet. You need something? Let's go ahead. And I'll get All right. So um, what I have here is uh, I did first a test on the delicious. Uh, sorry, sorry. Let's get back to the big data, to the column store. So you store things in in columns rather than in rows. So if you think of a record, it has name, surname, and age, right? String, string, integer. In, in rows, row-oriented uh, data stores, they store it like um, horizontally. So you have uh, the string, the string, and then the integer, and then the next record. If you think about column stores, they store it vertically. So you have the all the strings together, all the names together, all the surnames together, and then all the uh, age, the in, it fills together. When you're doing big data, that's usually about aggregation. So computing the average or the sum or the standard deviation, whatever, about the age. So when you do that across all the fields, and you're, you're not using all the columns, right, for that operation, just you probably get the, the, not even the name, because aggregation is just only for the age field. It goes directly in vertical way. So it's way more efficient. Plus, you can uh, also, um, do compression, transparent compression. 
because data look like very similar if, if, if written vertically, right? You have all the age fields together, you have all the names fields together. They are way more compressible than using like uh, horizontally, where you have the string, uh, sorry, you have a string and an integer and a date stamp, a timestamp, whatever, and that's more difficult to compress. So that's what basically columnar, st columnar stores do. So, talking about numbers, to give you an idea of how this works. For example, um, storing the delicious, delicious uh, data set, which is a public data set, bookmarks, the plain text version required uh, 1.2 gigabytes of disk space. Mongo required uh, 2.08 gigabytes for storing the same data. So 1.2 to, uh, to, uh, to, to 2 gigabytes. Uh, we did uh, okay with uh, 1.4, just slightly more than the textual representation. And the big data version with compression enabled did 0 0.4. So we're basically doing, compared to Mongo, uh, from 20 to 67% of the storage required. It's, all right, which basically means huge storage savings which means way less I.O., which means way faster queries. First of all, because you're querying the structure and effectively partitioning the data, and then you are reading less data. Because we have to finish, I'm going to read some of the numbers faster. Uh, there's also, a, uh, we ran a little benchmark on, the, on a GitHub public archive data set, and the, uh, this was a bigger data set, and the, the whole data set requires in plain, plain text uh, 19 gigabytes, Mongo required almost 30 gigabytes to store the same data, and we required uh, six, only 16, so less than the, uh, the, uh, the baseline, the text version, which means basically half of what Mongo requires. We did not perform the big data here, so I don't have the numbers. And running a, a synthetic, very bad benchmark, so these numbers are very bad because the uh, it generates documents where the text is mo most of the time a large Gibson variation. But anyway, what was the test well, that we want to perform? And for this case, the, the plain text required 2.5 gigabytes. Mongo required uh, 4.6 gigabytes to store the same data. Our version required 1.3, which is almost 50% of the plain text version. And the big data version required 0 0.05. So compared to Mongo, we're getting in, in our regular version, uh, our storage requirements are 29% of Mongo's, and big data version is 1.16% <coughs> of what Mongo requires. So two orders of magnitude less. Yesterday, yes, I'm just finishing, and yesterday, uh, Ian uh, handed to me a small data set uh, of, of his own to try it. And the results are that the, we, the raw text required 46 megabytes. We uh, stored the information in uh, 46, just a little bit less, 98%. Mongo requires, required 83, almost double. And big data version required only 11 megabytes. So 25% of the storage required uh, by text uh, version and 12% of what Mongo requires. This, uh, uh, this size reduction is tremendous. Yes. Uh, but I would like to ask you three questions. Um, first of all is, when you have um, documents uh, of the same time, for example, a person class, yeah. with, uh, in which some uh, um, some fields, uh, I'm thinking of MongoDB, yeah. are uh, omitted or are yes. missing. Yeah. We, uh, your database stores them as a different data type. So yes. we have many partitions and it's like more fragmented. Yes, yes, exactly. exactly. So uh, if uh, somebody does not want to, uh, to uh, put a value on a field, he must declare the field. No, not at all. I mean, this it is, is done all by your tribe. Right? Yes, yes, it's absolutely transparent. Yes, it's true. They will end up in different tables, in which case, 
So in that case, the queries of uh, all the documents we have uh, about the same, the, the common data, mm -hmm. they will need to touch several tables, yeah. but those tables are going to be smaller. And they're usually really small, most of them. And that means they're usually cached in memory. That's very nice. Another thing is aggregation. Aggregation. Well, yeah. aggregation, first of all, in the big data version works way better because of the storage reduction and transparent compression. And well, and, and one thing I didn't mention is that, of course, when querying the data, we're converting also between the Mongo queries to SQL queries. Oh, so that's much, much faster. Yes, and that, of course, includes the, uh, the aggregation framework. Specifically, if you're interested in this topic, there's a very nice blog post about uh, from Dimitri Fontaine. It's, uh, one of the biggest Postgres hackers knows a lot about performance, where, which is basically a copycat of, of a similar blog post but some, by someone in the Mongo community, which did some big data kind of analysis on NBA basketball data. And they were using it in Mongo with the aggregation framework. And then he did the same with SQL in Postgres. Not only was faster, it was way simpler. I mean, the, the Mongo queries were like chunks of code this length very hard to understand, if, even if we are into the Mongo world. Whereas the SQL version, using uh, the, what is called the, the CTs, the common table expressions, it's a syntax supported by, by Postgres and some of databases, it was like crystal clear what they were doing. That's great because uh, a client of ours, uh, we had to develop a system which used MongoDB. Okay, the storage was okay, but when uh, the client asked uh, to uh, to prepare some reports, the application queries were huge. Yeah. And then the uh, even the even though we have added multiple indexes in the database, the application times for 13 million documents was not. I don't think it's big data. No, no, no. no, uh, no. It could va vary from two minutes to up to five minutes, and that's not acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was in a web application. That's the thing that they need to scan the whole database. Yeah or uh, aggregate over fields that they don't know even if they're the same data type. So you, you, you're storing field age, that may be a string or a time, right? So you need to scan the whole database, look at all the documents, check that they're of the same data type over you, which you could perform that aggregation, mm -hmm. and then do that. Whereas here, we have, first of all, we have partitioned the data type. So we already know the time, right? So we already know which subset to look at. And then if you're using the, the columnar store, you have all the data locally stored continuously in, 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 in dust, which will eventually be continuously stored in memory. And you perform the operation absolutely fast. We don't have numbers yet for that. But we really have to wrap this up. All right. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> we have to get to the other session. Yes, 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 absolutely. What's the name of your project? OK, that's a good question. Uh, it's going to be called the, so very, very few uh, people are, have ever done a database. It's, it's not something like a lot of people do. And very few, very few products come from Europe. And in particular, none has come from, from Spain or for, from any speak, uh, Spanish-speaking country. So we're, gonna, we're giving it a name which closely resembles our culture or something which is known about Spaniards, which is the, the bulls. Dog. So it's called Dolody.